Dig Lazarus Dig is the the only album where I've been a fan and it's come out at the time when I've been a fan as opposed to having to retrospectively go out and buy all the old albums, which was really great. And, you know, seeing the videos come up on the internet. When I went to go and see uh, Dig Lazarus Dig live, fuck me, that was amazing. I'd never seen Nick Cave before and it was just, it blew me away. I wouldn't have expected an album like Dig Lazarus Dig out of them. I think it's a very 21st century record and so, so many especially the early Nick Cave albums seem to be of their time but this one almost feels like a culmination of so much of what's gone before. To people our age it just it just seemed quite refreshing that an old older guy was could still hit moves better than Jagger in the 60s and write really great pop music. The whole thing with, with Dig Lazarus Dig was um, that it came on the, the, the heels of, of uh, the Grinder Man record. And, you know, Grinder Man was much more rooted, you know, it, it, it's hairy and it's greasy and it's an ape and, you know, um, and it's id and primal. And uh, I think that, um, you know, it was important to kind of almost, you know, get that testosterone f fueled stuff, if not out of the system, or at least out in the open a little bit. I think it actually Im has impacted his whole life and his whole approach to life. Actually getting, getting older is really, really great. It sort of seems to have created this, you know, energy. Um, certain things you let go of um, at a certain, seems like at a certain point. It's quite a big deal for them to break away from being Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds to you know, not just making the Grinder Man album, but to take it out and play it live, you know. I think it's great that they do all these other side projects because it feeds back into the seeds. The Grinder Man musicians made the demos before the record. And so they had this a lot of, I don't know, 40 songs or something. They had a lot of material who went in a new direction. So that was a big change. I think it's just a thing of whatever, you, whatever you've done before influences what comes after. And, uh, you know, whether that's going away and, and, and playing with somebody else or playing with another band or whether it's doing a soundtrack or whatever it is, you know, that it, it's all, it's not like, oh, I'm going to work in here, so I think in this way or that way or this way. It's like a you know a, con a continuation of of some kind of uh, trajectory. Also, the kind of man influence of the band is, makes it really interesting. This is just different. You, it's, it's open. It's completely open now. What you can do. And because of the 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 way that that record came over and and was loved, liked a lot by um, by young people in particular. I think was really shocking to, to Nick. I think he was. It was just like this. Wow, people are actually like this, and people are, are taking this on board. And the way that people were reacting to some of the songs made him uh, realize that he could actually sing about anything he wanted to, and 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 almost do anything he wanted to, because you know suddenly it was like the doors were open. I think it. Um conceptually freed him up a little bit. And, uh, you know, there's just some great, great stuff on Dick Lazarus' Dig album, starting from the first song. After the first kind of opening refrain, I just remember this kind of wave of absolute kind of childish, giddy excitement um, totally and utterly immersed me because the song is just so good. It's the perfect, perfect Nick Cave song. It's... It's a great concept, the idea of Lazarus coming back to life and, and living in present-day New York, which is, you know, that's a novel waiting to be written, surely. That came about uh, because um, I did a book on Houdini called The Secret Life of Houdini, and uh, I knew that this would be a subject that Nick would have some interest in, and I sent him a copy of the book, and then I got an email back. I'm reading the book. It's great. And then I got another email back. I'm going to actually write a song and it, it, I'm going to dedicate it to you and Harry. The Lazarus Houdini, whoever he is on, on, that, on that song, it's just, a, it's just a great kind of conflation of totally contradictory ideas and he's kind of banged them together and see that the song sparks out as a result. And Nick 
sent it to me, emailed it to me, and uh, and I listened to it, and it was Dig Lazarus Dig, and somehow uh, he had conflated the idea of Houdini and and the, do the spirit do the spirits you know rise from the dead that they communicate uh, with the you know great uh, biblical character Lazarus, and somehow Lazarus became Larry, and there was this guy Larry now. You know, I'm friendly with Nick, but he doesn't know that many, you know, kind of intimate details about my life. And unless he researched this, there was some very bizarre coincidences in that song. It's great to take these characters that are so well known and put them into kind of a modern setting. He talked about Larry living in his little aerial perch, and I lived on the top floor in Soho, this apartment building with some baby blasted mothers and I had two relationships with, <laughs> I had stepdaughters. It captures you and it captures your imagination and it, it captures the essence of, uh, of the chances that somebody would take in, in the big city for the first time. There was all these strange biographical con congruences and I hope, you know, the, the rest of the song doesn't come through because I don't want to wind up on the Bowery. It has, this fierce humor uh, and this energy, but it's also, it's a, I imagine that as like a pub song, people around a, a piano, a late night sing along and, and all the drunken choir of, of the people in the bar singing the dig yourself bit. And, and that, that again is a sign of supreme confidence to be able to do something that, uh, if you looked at it a different way, could just be funny and throw away and disposable. The whole spirit of the thing is Tongue in cheek would be the wrong word, but just hear, they are so good, so powerful, and and serious musically that they can afford to just laugh at themselves and everybody. Um, the lyrics, I mean, dig Lazarus dig itself. Um, it's spot on. I mean, it reminds me of it's up there with Dylan, Lou Reed, and Leonard Cohen. It's an absurd and uh, meaningless thing to draw parallels with other artists, but I'm going to do it because I'm absurd and largely meaningless. But of anyone, that album makes me think of Dylan, especially the title track. It makes me think it, it's, it's got that kind of gleeful, freewheeling, speedy association, fun, you know, rooted in a kind of a bluesy groove. I think there's a little bit of Hispanic rhythm to it, or salsa, or... Um, maybe it's salsa, I don't know, it reminds me of, of Brooklyn. Something in Dig Lazarus Digs, the very first time, um, in the rhythm, in the, the, the beat, the whole thing just sounded like New York. It definitely has a gritty, um, almost a gritty kind of 70s Times Square kind of feel, where you don't really want to turn the corner down that dark alleyway. <laughs> it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit seedy. How did you put it? Um, like, so that I want a very strong mechanical uh, groove to all the songs. I want it to be like a machine, like just insistent groove to these songs. Because I'm a drummer, I really like, the, you know, that kind of the, how it just kind of, kind of almost hits you. It's like, and, and, and you can't help but dance. There's a percussive um, um, feel to it, which is so, um, it's like, um, it's like you. It's like you walk through the streets, and I don't know. You. It's. It's. It's very physical. The song is very physical. Sexy. It just had a sense of motion to it as well. I think that was the other, just completely overwhelming feeling was New York City and movement. I mean, I think the the idea for the video really. Um, you know, it, it came from the music. As soon as Dig Lazarus Dig started playing, I could feel my body kind of moving with the the sort of the rhythm of it and the pace of it. And immediately we began talking about it kind of, it propels you forward. There was a moment in the video, I, I don't know whether it's intentional, where for a couple of seconds he seemed to forget the words. And uh, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I very much like the fact that that was, that was kept in because it gave the video a sort of a live performance um, one shot sort of quality that I very much liked. Some videos you get the sense that there's an idea for the video and there's the music and someone somewhere kind of hopes that if you bang the two together they might kind of coexist in, in some way that's acceptable. Um, 
but for me, Dig and the, the, the video we made and that track are just, you know, they're intrinsically linked. It was there, it was there in the music. We just had to kind of find a way of being able to actually make it happen in front of a camera. It's, it's, it's so groovy and sexy and it's New York and it reminds me of my New York days and it's, it's, it's really perfect from the first sound that you hear to the last one. From the first track I heard, I was uh, like, wow, you know, this is just great, you know. And I really um, got a, a mood from, from them and it was actually a very joyous kind of mood and a very, I got a, I got a new mood from the Bad Seeds with, with it. The music they're making at the moment is the best music they've ever made. I, I really do think that. If you take a song like um, Today's Lesson, that's kind of almost like a dream. I have this picture, you know, this little Janie who's asleep on the floor, and then she, and this, she's got these jeans on and then this jawbone down the back of her jeans. And to me, that just shows... it's. It's, it's, it, it gives you a kind of a dream atmosphere. Um, you know, the way that um, objects can mutate when, you, when, you're, when you're dreaming, so you have something turning into something else. Then this line is just genius. He likes to congregate around the intersection of Janie's genes. I mean, it's just so... <laughs> it's so... so in, sort of brilliant, because never mind feminism or anything or any... You just are like right there with it. You're, you're completely convinced. What I've, I've loved about it is the fact that there are, you know, that there are layers of, of, of um, caves reading in there, um, particularly two things. Uh, firstly, John Berryman. I think that's very clear when you, when you listen to the work, um, how it's fed by um, an enormous amount of kind of... Uh, an, ex an enormously kind of rich um, kind of linguistic landscape that it's kind of plucked from the 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 visions he has and the the songs he sees the nervosity the the energy um, and the um, I don't know the the humor as well because Berryman's Berryman's crackers but he's very funny and you know to me dig Lazarus dig the whole albums like that I've always been a big kind of advocate of reading because I think reading does something extraordinary to your brain and the way you process emotions and feelings and memories and your understanding of complex and sometimes incomprehensible situations. That's not the answer to everything, but words can often do that. And, and I think that Nick's wide range of reading is one of the things that's allowed him to kind of know what he thinks through seeing what he says, through what other people say. I remember when I first heard it, I was just so shocked and so st sort of stunned by how brilliant that was, the way he takes you out of all the kind of programming, or he took me out of all that, all my kind of resistance, you know, to... Um, being at the intersection of James Jeans is totally, totally mad. I just love that. If you're not aware of the dark side, you're blind, but if you're not aware of the other side and the fact that the two are kind of inextricably linked, then I don't think, then I think you've um, yet to understand one aspect of, of what it means to be human. He makes you th want to think in a, in a more kind of adventurous way. I've got this recording of Berryman. Um, he did a reading at the Guggenheim in 1963, just before the, the Dream songs were published for the first time. And he talks about this. He's, he's, he talks about um, the Dream songs themselves. And he says, you know, I have to remind you that it's not me talking, it's Henry. Um, and not, is, not only is it Henry talking, um, he's not even really talking because he's dreaming, you know. So um, it's like, ev you know, the Dream songs are filtered through the character of Henry but Henry's not even awake at the time. And, and so that, what that allows Berryman to do is to just um, play around with reality and play around with sentence structure and play around with um, images and come up with things that... that um, and juxtapose things really um, in really exciting ways, which I think you get in a song like um, Today's Lesson. I mean, he doesn't give a fuck what you do, you know. 
he's just doing his thing, but that's that's the result. And and um, I think it's what makes him continually so interesting. You know, I mean, there's not many people who you want to see again and again, but with Nick, every time he plays, there's something new going. There's something else that he's bringing to the to the things that he's done before. And there's also like another um, incredible experience of watching the band live that you probably don't get listening to the album um, on the track Moonland. There's this strange instrument that um, you can sort of hear in the very silently in the distance of if you're listening to the album, it's like a I call it like a it's like a hand drum. I still have no idea what that sound actually is. It goes like this in the in the in the background. And um, when you're watching the band live, it's like this little tiny drum that I think um, I don't know if Warren's kind of he's invented this thing and he must have done because it's it's far too perverted to actually exist in real life. I think if if we look on the multi track, that's that's actually called goose wank. It's like this little drum, and he and he wraps his hand in a cloth and then he wets the cloth and then he sort of. He put, puts the hand inside the drum and, and, and writhes around and plays this, this funny sound. And, it, and live, it's like he's actually putting his hand up a girl's skirt and fiddling around, and it creates this weird sort of wet noise. They sound great live. Oh, them. even the Lotus Eaters, which on the record, you know, I much prefer it live. Live is a completely different thing than the record, too. So the live version is great, too, especially for live, especially when you start the... the the set with this, when the, 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 this, this riff comes from Warren and then Slavons go in this heartbeat and then the uh, percussion style uh, things and everything. This is, uh, is uh, it's quite good, yeah, to, to play a completely different version for live. It's just more, more out there, you know. Well, to see this was a, is, uh, was a whole, uh, this great moment in the studio where uh, you improvise. I can remember improvising. Just went, just started playing. I didn't know that they even recorded. So many times, there'll be this thing where, without any warning at all, he'll just start playing. And, and then, you know, they'll do this great take, and at the end of it, he'll go, "Were you, were you rolling, Lorne?" So this is this is this is it's a, a real um, an improvising, uh, also improvising to the loop from Warren, and even Nick was. There was we we tried to play it again, but that was the track. A lot of the. The 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 non groove songs, let's say, that are great on that record are, are moody in 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 a particular way because of the loops that uh, Warren sets up. Well, I started, I first off started using them with uh, Dirty Three for a recording and Mick Turner had one of the first kind of sampling pedals. That that process of of them starting with a loop and then everybody joins in and the mood of, of, of the loop makes them play certain things. I think that does happen a, a, quite a bit on, um, on Dig Lazarus Dig as well, although I think it's a lot more over the top in a way. It's a lot more, um, it, it, it's almost done with a lot more confidence. The way that that looped backing suddenly rises and it drops into a different looped backing groove. I, I just think the album's got so much depth, creativity and um, sheer bombast from this uncontrollable force that is now the bad seeds. I, I just think they're unstoppable juggernaut. With this relentless driving rhythm and beautiful bass lines and beautiful sounds and layers with these just quite abstract stories over the top. And this was great. I like it a lot. This is uh, completely different to the others. That's kind of free form underneath a free form music going on and the spooky the spooky lyrics I love that song there's there's definitely an, there's a there's an intensity on that song for me anyway it kind of has the same thing to me as something like um, the Carney and Tupelo and 
I suppose, call upon the author. That just fills my heart with delight. <laughs> that almost disco-y, techno-y thing they do. I worked was there when they were mixing that, and that funky little break in the middle. Um, when they were mixing it, before, before they'd mixed it properly, it just kicked in and it was ten times louder than anything else. And it sounded amazing. And I was a bit disappointed when I heard the uh, final version. I, f I find myself just turning that bit up. Warren had this this thing that he kind of turns on on his one of his pedals. He turns it on every now and then for a joke, and uh, it just became such a familiar joke that it had to become one of the songs. And that, that's how things happen. It's almost at the time it was kind of ridiculous, and it didn't work as well as it does on the final thing. But the the but there was definitely, it was definitely a planned decision. It wasn't an accident, you know, it was like, this is what's going to happen. At this point in the song, it's going to cut to this completely alien sound. The funky bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's so not us that uh, it seemed quite uh, perfect to have a breakdown like that. I haven't heard those kind of breaks, those deliberate halts in songs since, maybe since the early stuff. There would just be this point of the song where, Nick would suddenly signal the stop and, you know, obviously Jim would be watching him and everybody would be watching him and they'd all stop and, and Warren would just push the space bar on, on his laptop and it would go... You know. well, when they do that live, it's just... It's so good. It was great. That's a great moment when the loop takes over, you know. I never thought I'd see Nick wiggle. <laughs> quite the way he wiggles in the middle of that song. The energy from the sound and the energy from Nick on stage and now with Warren in the band, it's like the two of them together, it's quite, you know. He was like seemingly writhing around on the floor, flaying his arms in the air. And I kind of, I managed to peek over the, the speakers to see what was going on and, and I realised that he was actually using the the effects pedals of the, uh, the, the normally a guitarist would play with his feet. He was he was playing them with his. He was on the floor playing the effects pedals and the echo machine, whatever it was, with his hands. And he was playing this thing like an organ, and it was just so extraordinarily refreshing and chaotic. And then the scissor sound, what I call the scissor sound, that very top end kind of thing that goes around your head, the that was that was added afterwards, and it sounds a bit like. Uh, you know, you, you, you're caught in a, in a lawnmower or something. That's what it sounds like, all these blades cutting you up, which to me is the scissors sound of being edited. Prolix, prolix, nothing a pair of scissors can't fix. I can't think of any other songwriter who's used that word in a pop song. It's, it's, it's a delight in language. It's a, an immediate joy in language. I'm sure it sent many people reaching for their dictionaries. Prolix means overlong and... Uh, so many of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds songs are long, not over long, but it's as though he's making some kind of joke about himself as the author. It, it, no one else is going to write a song like Call Upon the Author to Explain. Lyrically, nobody would broach that as a topic even. How would someone begin to write that song? It's bordering on being a pop song, Call Upon the Author. It's like it would be the most intelligent pop song ever written, but regardless, it's a pop song. The lyrics sort of knock me out. I told Nick at the time that when uh, the, the record was being made that um, um, not just that song, but uh, the album in general, it seemed like um, seemed like he was almost hemorrhaging words. Dig Lazarus, dig really, it really hangs together as a uh, as a an old-fashioned album, you know. It's not. Um, you know, three or four great songs with a whole bunch of filler in the middle. It's kind of the first one that I have listened to as a whole in a row so many times. You know, I've never, I don't know that I've ever listened to individual tracks off it. I think I've always just played it from start to finish. You put on one track, you want to listen to the whole thing. I really like Hold On To Yourself on that one. I think this is the most beautiful song. I like the expansiveness of of the music in it, it kind of sort of sounded like an English expanse rather than an Australian one for the first time. It just continually amazes me that he can write a song of such beauty. I like the fact that it, I think it's got a nylon string guitar in it and I didn't associate that with, with the Bad Seeds before and 
I like the fact that I thought there were seagulls in the background that had been sampled and I thought maybe, you know, Nick had been down on Brighton Beach with a microphone. Fear that it sounds like the sea and it sounds, it reminds me of home, which cave songs do sometimes. It reminds me of the Antipodes, the kind of ugly, pretty thing that you get down there in the landscape. I actually said to Mick that um, I thought it should have been a single and Mick said, yeah, he thought it should have been a single as well. So it wasn't just me, it was an absolutely stunning, stunning achievement, I think. One of the very strange things about Nick and the Bad Seeds, I don't think you think you'll find any musician that has progressed both artistically and commercially over such a long period of time. Like, you know, if you're doing it on a graph paper, it would always go up, up and up. If you take Dig Lazarus Dig as a record, by the way, the highest chart in the Cave and the Bad Seeds album in the UK ever, and you listen to Lie Down Here and Be My Girl, and it's just raw and it's dirty, it's a quintessential Bad Seeds song. I can imagine it, they made it in 10 minutes, you know? It's everything the Bad Seeds are as a collective and that, but... It's, it could have been written by a 21-year-old Nick Cave. That has never changed. If anything, he's become um, m more envisioned and, and, and more powerful and, and, and more raw and uh, uh, more militant, I think, as the albums have, uh, have went on. Yeah, I think that, that with Dig Lazarus Dig, the, the confidence that comes across when you hear that record is the confidence that was there when it was made. Everybody was very kind of excited, excited to be there. And there was this general, uh, uh, you know, it was very optimistic, actually. I think if you're an uncompromising artist in the beginning, um, if you're a comedian who, who whose comedy is as cutting edge as it can be, or, or you're an artist who's making albums that don't sound like anybody else making records at that time, inevitably, as you get older, you get soft. That's what happens, you know. Eddie Murphy does Raw, and then he does Dr. Doolittle 20 years later. And I, I think there's very few uncompromising artists who actually become more raw as they go through their career. Any band that's been, a, or artist that's been around for 30 years, uh, a phrase you'll often hear described as a return to form. Now, when most people say a return to form, what they really mean is, well, it's better than the last two crap albums. But the words return to form is n are never used when you come to talk about Nick, Nick Cave because he's never really lost his form. There's a, there's a lyric in Lie Down Here and Be My Girl. You see, that song for me I love. It's one of my favourite ever because it's every man I've, I've ever wanted to be is that song. He comes back. She, she, let's not forget... She's she slept with somebody else. That's, but but she's not going to come round. He's not going to come round anymore, and he he's, he doesn't have any problem with that because he's been off somewhere. He comes back like the ultimate cowboy in the ultimate western, and he says that he has to be delicate with her because she's as brittle as, as a wishbone on a bird. And that, that that's so. The song for me is is just lyrically the most raw thing I've on that album. With the lyrics and stuff, it was a bit like he was looking at some of the subjects that he perhaps written about before, but it was almost like, how can I fuck this, this stuff up? Lie down here and be my girl is quintessentially proof that Nick Cave's edges have not been smoothed off. My favourite song on Dig is actually Jesus of the Moon. That song in particular, I just felt that, you know, will it be you or will it be me just really got to me and, and the questioning of of the inevitability of, of the relationship's demise. It's a very smoky song. There's a very atmospheric feel from, from the drums and the bass. You get that feeling, that almost eerie feeling that someone's inside your head. It reminded me of, I think of William Blake quite a lot with, uh, with Nick's work. And I think he wrote this great thing called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And I, to me, that's always going on that kind of, that, um, dialogue in Nick's work, this kind of, and this acceptance that of the marriage of heaven and hell. And one of the lines in it that Blake talks about is stagnant waters breed reptiles of the mind. And that to me was just a lovely echo of that thing about people being afraid of change, but I'm afraid of things not changing. He has to change in order to, to move and to keep moving forward. 
Um, and it's something that I, I, I identify with particularly, and it's just a fantastic line. It's this lovely little kind of play on fear and fear of the unknown, and actually the most fearful thing of all is that things would, have, would stay the same. And I just, that to me has been such a, um, a kind of, I think a lot of the philosophies that I find buried in his work are ones that have increasingly become philosophies of my own, which I've discovered from lots of different sources. But when you you read and hear someone who says things that you've felt before, but they chime, but they express them better than you've, or more beautifully than you've been ever able to express them to yourself, then um, that's when you feel a real connection with with art and with an artist's work. I think that's what Nick Cave does. He really draws you into the story and, and you almost become one of the characters. Sometimes when you, you know, there's a band that you really love and it's the lyrics that do it and sometimes it's the music that do it, does it. It's everything with this. And um, it take, it's, like a, it's like a journey you go on and every time you listen to it, it's another journey. It's true artist. That's that's a, the, 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 he's a true artist. That's what it, that's, with a capital A, by the way. You know, I know all the red companies they call everybody artists now. Everybody's an artist, but they're not. They're not lifetimers. Nick is a lifetimer. I'm a lifetimer. You know, Bruce is a lifetimer. The great Johnny Cash and Muddy Waters and uh, John Lee Hookers and all lifetimers. They were born to do this. They're going to be there for life. I can't believe he's turned 50 and he's still making records of the quality he's making. He's still performing with the kind of intensity he is. He's exactly the same as he is in the rehearsal room as he is on stage. It's, it was quite something to behold. Well, I think all the best performers have got that, um, they command attention, you know, and they're charismatic enough for, you know, for you to enter their world, you know? It's like watching a really amazing movie. You're kind of, you know, you're taken out of this kind of dreamlike state. I think they're so formidable and so um, confident because they believe it. And I think that's what really, sh you know, that really shines. You know, Nick's always had great players around him. You know, the bad seeds have always They've always, you know, the best, you know, I think. You know, it's like, um, it's a serious band, you know. Watching them now is, is, is quite incredible um, because they still, they still have this energy that I first encountered when I walked into that um, electric ballroom all those years ago. There is no other band to touch them with this album. Um, Midnight Man. I think that's my favourite song on the album. I remember it a lot in, in my mind at the recording time thinking, this is really good, this is really, really fucking good. I love it. Uh, to me, it sounds like, um, I can imagine The Doors, you know, I can imagine it's like on a Doors album. And, you know, I really love The Doors, and I love, love Jim Morrison, and I don't know, I think that song's good enough to be on a Doors album, you know, and the Doors, you know, they don't have any bad songs, I don't think. And it was a particular moment when we were doing the recording that you knew that this was something special and this was something very, um, very striking. The songs that, that struck out, stuck out for me were Midnight Man and uh, More News From Nowhere. I remember when Nick first sent that to me, you know, because it, it was like, as he was, I guess as he was mastering or you know, getting a final or quasi-final version, you know, I kept on emailing him, send me more, come on, send me more. And when he sent me uh, more, uh, more news from nowhere, um, I sent him back uh, and said, man, this is your Desolation Row. Because to me, the song had, had that kind of scope and that had, had that kind of importance. And in some ways it was a kind of almost summing up of you know all of his past and characters were flying in and out. I didn't know this but that it's the story of Odysseus told through Nick Cave's life. That blew my mind. It's basically my love life um, uh, to the Odyssey. So I listened to it like 20 times before I even realized that was there and this whole like, oh, this is so clever. Finstad's not a uh, 
not a, as that huge a cave fan, but he listened to it once and was like, oh yeah, it's, that's the story of Odysseus. If you wanted to uh, do the Roman clay, you can um, identify all the people in it, and um, all except Cyclops. Um, and uh, it's very, very cheeky um, about everyone, including himself. I don't think he'll ever escape his music. And I don't think, and I think as long as he doesn't escape his music, then the listener won't be able to escape it either. I was idly listening to MTV, I think, and I saw the video and I, 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 I liked the setting of the video. And so I was kind of attracted by this and I suddenly realised it's the bad seeds. I don't know, it seemed a little bit like no one had made a record like that before. I sat back and listened and some of the, some of the lines are like, mm, that's that's good because I I hadn't listened to a lot a lot of the the band's work for a long time although I was, I was deeply deeply involved with the the songs in the very early stages it's like it's it's looking backwards at the same time as looking forwards it, it, it's an album that takes into account everything he's done the problem with artists like Nick Cave is that they raise the bar so high that I would hate to be in a band now trying to create anything similar because he does so many of the th uh, he does so many um opposites so well that he doesn't leave much room for for anyone else to better no messing around you know what we can do is wide open now i think we can we can go in all sorts of directions you know who knows what the next one will be like you know it's it's hard to, it's, you know who, and I mean, that's the great thing you know I don't think anyone has any idea at the moment. Star spangled and the coins in my pocket go jingle. 